Uh, hey everyone, just want to give you the official welcome. Um, really excited about today. I think we've got a really interesting format and discussion here with, with Gib. We've got a couple of other people joining us um, on the panel, so to speak. We've got Camilla and, and Lily from Terum, and we've got Michael from the AICD, who's the head of product at AICD, and we've got Patrick Collins, who's head of product at Zip, um, or chief product officer at Zip. And so what, what we're going to be doing is having a bit of a like really interactive format. So jump on the chat, um, you use the, use the, uh, the app. We really want to get into a bit of a discussion. I, um, do you want to go next slide, Gib? Please. There it is. Cool. So we got, uh, Gib look. Oh, I went to, a... oh. so introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I thought a slide went missing there. Yes, I'm Scott, CEO of Terum. We're a product development and strategy firm uh, across the eastern seaboard of Australia. Um, on the AFR, been involved in a bunch of product launches. I think what what um, Gib and I were connecting over our, our love of, of sailing. So um, Gib, do you want to go next slide? So sure. Gib's former VP of product at Netflix, as well as Chegg. I think some really interesting stories that... Um, I've since learned about prior to that as well that kind of have really shaped Gibbs' journey. But to give you a bit of a personal front, so I found out today that Gib grew up sailing, did his 10,000 hours as a sailor. And I'm now kind of questioning, did you consider a career in sailing instead of product management, Gib? Well, I, my first startup was a sailing school. Um, there you go. And so did that for two years, but I stayed, I chose to keep my athletic pursuit of skiing and sailing radically separate from my work pursuit. From and I think I made the right call. Makes sense. I'm going to hand over to you now, Gib, all yours. Cool. Okay. Welcome everyone. I'm here to talk today really about product strategy, but I'm going to do it through the lens of Netflix. And I'm assuming, and you can let me know in the chat if you are a yes, yes, you're a member or no, you're not. Um, I want you to chill, relax, because there's a PDF available of this presentation at gibsonbiddle.com backslash strategy. Camilla is going to link bomb you at the end. So early in my career, uh, I joined first Electronic Arts, but then I built kids educational software. And my first hit product was called Elmo's Preschool. Elmo comes from Sesame Street. Um, and lots of folks were delighted. It was my first hit software. And then I sold, that was my first startup in the professional realm outside of sailing schools. I sold that company to this dude. This is Kevin O'Leary. You might recognize him as Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank, but he was the CEO of the learning company and we helped that company to grow. And then in fact, we turned around and sold it to Mattel for a whopping big figure, something like $4 billion. Um, and so it was a big deal and I felt pretty good about things until a year later, the valuation of that entity had dropped from 4 billion down to 400 million. And I had failed to create long-term hard to copy advantage. Turned out that a bunch of uh, other software companies were able to copy the work that we did. And I've just described the first half of my career and that was sort of brutal. So I came along in 2005, this is Reed Hastings. He's the CEO of Netflix. And many folks outside the US don't know it, but Netflix began as a DVD by mail company. These red envelopes would go back and forth in the mail. And Reed interviewed me, he asked me two questions. First, he said, hey, can you delight customers, Gib? And I said, yes, I, I built Elmo's preschool. And luckily his kids had, had used it and they'd loved it. And then the second thing he asked is, can you do consumer science? And luckily I knew what he meant because I had asked him what he wanted his legacy to be. And that was his answer, consumer science. He said, hey, I'm just a geeky engineer. I can't predict the tastes of everyone, but if we can experiment and test and learn, we can answer any number of questions and, and we will eventually be successful. And I lied a little and said, yes, you know, I can do consumer science. So Scott gave me my background. The key thing is I started Netflix in 2005. Um, by 2010, I went on to my next startup, but I've kept up with my pals at Netflix. 
So this talk, we've really got three chapters. I'm gonna talk about just three strategy frameworks that I find helpful in, in defining a product strategy and helpful providing context for an organization. And then I'm gonna take a bunch of these different frameworks and I'm gonna apply them. I'm gonna pretend that I'm back at Netflix and I'm gonna share uh, a, a simplified approximation of, of the product strategy. And then we're gonna test it with these two juicy cases. Scott, all good? All good. Cool beans. So let's do the frameworks. First, I wanna give you a sense of how I think about what strategy is. And this is from Hamilton Helmer. He's a professor of economics at Stanford. He talks about it as a route to continuing power in a significant market. So imagine it's, oh gosh, uh, 3000 BC, and you're somewhere approximately where China is today, and you've got these jewels and metals and silk and spices, and you're trying to figure out how to get them to London. And, and what should that route be? Should it be by land or by sea? And it turns out a bunch of explorers through exploration, through experimentation, created, this is the Silk Road. And if you look carefully, you can see the Great Wall of China in the background. And this ended up test, standing the test of time. It, it, had, it, it created a route of incredible, uh, um, of lots of economic market for a long, long time. It was very, very hard to copy. And that's really the way I think about strategy. And why do I focus on strategy? The first, it helps me to do the, the hardest thing as a product leader, which is to communicate an inspired vision of the future. The next is it blends discipline and chaos. So most innovative things, it's like they come out of the dirt, out of the mud. And if you over-discipline things, you can't have that sort of delightful discovery. But if you just let it be chaotic, you, you don't tend to get the results in, in directions that are helpful to you. So I love how a strategy can blend both the discipline and the chaos. The strategy helps you to form hypotheses to delight customers in these hard to copy margin enhancing ways where margin enhancing is just a fancy way to make money to, that, you, that you essentially want to reinvest in building a better product in the future. And then as product leaders, we can, we can do anything. We just can't do everything. So we could think of a hundred things that would make the product better. And we can only do five or 10 of them. So a strategy will help you identify what, what are the top five or things, 10 things we're going to do. And then it helps you to communicate a plan. As companies grow, there's a lot of confusion about how everything fits together and, and having a strategy can help provide some stronger sense of how things fit together. So I'm just gonna share briefly three frameworks with you and then I'll bring them to life. The first I call Glee, it spells something. The second, Gem, it spells something too. And DHM, I, I can't make it spell anything. The first one is about crafting a product vision where first you're going to get big and then later lead a second act of a company and expand further in a third act. And I'll show what that means in a second. Jam is a way about force ranking, forcing people in an organization to prioritize growth, engagement. Engagement is really retention or an engaging product, how to build a high quality product. That's what engagement is. And monetization is delivering that margin. DHM, I've talked about those three factors and the purpose of each I've brought to life here as well. So this DHM framework, I want to apply it to Netflix today and get you thinking about you know, what it means and, and why it might be helpful. And because really this defines the product leader's job, which I'm hoping you'll remember. And so now I want you thinking about Netflix. It took us many years to discover what delights customers. But I'm guessing if you look at this list and you're a Netflix member, you, you, you say, yeah, this is the kind of stuff that, that delights me. This is the kind of stuff I enjoy about Netflix. And then the margin enhancing, the, the, we experimented forever with the business model. At first, it was an a la carte. You get one DVD in the mail, it costs, 4.95 to show up and we bet the company on what it is today. At first it was an all you can eat subscription service for DVDs, but today you're enjoying an all you can eat subscription for streaming. 
And you've probably noticed that Netflix has been experimenting with the price and, and a concept of what a plan is. Is it a mobile only plan? Uh, does my plan uh, handle ultra high def, et cetera? And does it cost a little bit more? But I just wanna give you a subtlety about the real economic power of Netflix today. Today, they have more than 200 million members and they have the, the taste profiles for three or four people in each family. So they actually know the member tastes of 800 million people worldwide. And because of this, they're able to guess, to predict who's gonna like what. And the key thing is they wanna bring all these stories to life. They wanna do all the content you want, but the key thing is they wanna invest the right amount of money. So for instance, they predicted 100 million people would watch Stranger Things. And because of that, were willing to invest 800 million. And then they predicted that, and I, I'm a freak, I'm, I'm into BoJack Horseman. I noticed a few other folks were, um, but based on that 10 million, they said, okay, we'll make an, an 80 million investment in BoJack Horseman. And my point here is that it, it, this is the concept of right sizing, but it in, creates in, in, incredible economic power. They know better than any company on the face of the earth what to invest in or not. So I've talked about delight, I've talked about margin, and here's the question. What makes Netflix hard to copy? So Scott, I'm gonna put it out to the wisdom of crowds here. Um, I would love it if you hold up your, your phone as though you're taking a photo, hold it up to that QR code, uh, a link will magically pop up. And I'm very curious to see what folks all over the world believe is Netflix's hard to copy advantage today. And I know Scott is also carefully watching the chat. Um, so if you wanna pipe in through either of those means, super curious and really what I'm trying to do here is avoid the trap that I had in my career. Remember we created $4 billion of value and a year later it was only 400 million bucks. Okay, Scott, what do you see, what do you see? Uh, so there's a couple in the chat. I'm trying to answer the poll to make sure I'm doing the, I don't want to be shamed or, you know, incur a dollar cost for Mike. So I'm just making sure I answer the poll. Um, but what have we got? We got a, There's a couple of questions just around priorities. There's one around um, approach to launching content. And there's another around, uh, what have we got? Why did the gunpowder? It's a very specific one about a particular movie, which we might come back to near the end. <laughs> but... Yeah. Okay. So, um, my friend uh, Lily, if you want to give the play by play, what are the themes that you see from our audience today about what makes Netflix hard to copy? Yeah, the biggest ones are original content, branding, but even just content, data, scale. I'm loving all yeah. the, the additions that keep coming in, moving around. Patrick or Michael, anything missing? I, it's, it's not a, like, I, I'm staring to see what's, what if anything is missing or forgotten. And well, by the way, Lily, doesn't it just make your heart sing that, that, that product leaders all over the world understand the importance of a brand? Doesn't that make you happy? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised there's not, there's like- so it um, does. <laughs> I had thought for a long time that uh, the the number of devices that Netflix was able to be deployed into. You know what's funny? I was fishing. Into yeah. That. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's really interesting because one of the things that makes the work that we do hard to copy is a network effect. We actually tried to create a network effect by letting you connect with your friends and get your movie ideas from your friends. And you wouldn't quit because you didn't want to leave your friends. That failed. But the network effect we were able to create was the device ecosystem. And that's exactly what you were bringing up, Patrick. And it turns out that it takes many, many years. Imagine what it takes for every screen in the world to magically be pre-wired for Netflix. So I got lots of amazing responses there. Um, I sort of boil it down to these four issues. First, I really was delighted that the brand came up. But at the end of the day, we we're trying to create a product where movie enjoyment was made easy. That was the job. Lots of good examples of unique technology on that last slide. The one that I tend to focus on is personalization. The idea that you know the member taste of 800 million people. It's pretty cool. I know Patrick 
grumbles a little bit about it's hard to find stuff that he loves. Uh, but Netflix it does a better job every year through its interface of nicely surfacing the stuff that you'll love. We talked already about the network effect and I saw the original content. I call this economy of scale. So Netflix by virtue of, of having 200 million members can afford, afford to spend 20 billion on content this year where poor Amazon can only spend eight million, a billion. I just love saying poor Amazon. And, uh, and then dear Disney, rather, uh, Disney's probably at five or 6 billion. Yeah. And then Apple is at 2 billion. Go ahead, Scott. Can I, yeah, so just, just with um, some of these, like the economy of scale one's really interesting in that, it, like it's a factor now, but I'm just thinking back to when, when you were at Netflix, you know, you didn't probably have the scale of data and everything that you had then. So how, how did you think about, like, that wasn't a, a factor then. You couldn't say like, hey, our strategy is economy of scale. Well, you, you couldn't use that in your arsenal. So I'm just curious about how you yeah, thought about that, it. The key thing was we recognized how important it was to get big. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but the main thing we did it was we were putting engagement first, build a freaking awesome product for customers, growth second, and margin, you know, the economics third for many, many years. Um, but it, 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 we, we knew it was super important to get big. And so we did. So I want you to think of product strategies as hypotheses of how you'll delight in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. So I've done 20 or so different hypotheses here. Green is good, yellow is okay. And red, those are all failed experiments. I brought up the social of connecting with your friends. It turns out your friends have sucky movie days uh, and you don't really want them to know that you were watching, binge watching Cake Boss last night, okay? So, and then I put a bunch of question marks. Netflix is experimenting today with interactive stories. They just announced they hired a, a, a VP of games, for instance, and they're experimenting with some other new technologies with AR and VR. They don't know. But their hope is they will delight customers in these hard to copy margin enhancing ways. And the key thing here is notice that Netflix only got it right like five or six times, but that's enough, especially if it helps to build that hard to copy advantage. Uh, and so I, I, I included a link. I, I wrote a, like a 12 part essay. Each essay is three minutes on how to define your product strategy. So if you want to learn about the stuff that we talked about, it's all there. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is bring this to life and, and make some guesses. I'm gonna role play and pretend I'm back at Netflix. It's the beginning of 2021 and I'm gonna share what that product strategy might look like. All good, Scott? All good. Cool beans. You're okay. getting some shout outs on your, um, on your media articles, Give. Oh, good. From, from, good. From the audience. Yeah, some people are like, just freaking write the book. That's the book. It's free. It's sitting <laughs> there. Okay. So, hi. Um, I'm so excited to be back at Netflix. Uh, it's great to see all thousand product leaders in the room. Just want to nicely remind you what we set out to do. This is really the positioning of the product. Netflix is a movie subscription service that delivers fast, easy entertainment in a friendly, straightforward way. That was the product we set out to build. And the key thing, Neve Savage wanted to tattoo this phrase on my forearm. I, I chose not to. Movie enjoyment made easy. That's what my brand partner wanted us to deliver in the product. And I think that we've done a pretty good job of doing that. The long-term product vision, if you recall, the first thing we said, our initial beachhead was we're gonna get big on DVD. And then once we're big enough, we're going to lead streaming. By the way, we used to call that downloading. The word streaming didn't even exist. Customers thought you were saying streamlining, which is a bad word. And then once we were a fully digital service, we finally began to expand worldwide, which was cool. And then there was a failed hypothesis from 2008 when we launched something called Red Envelope Studios that failed. But when we re-experimented with the idea and in 2013 with House of Cards, original content began to pay off. And now it's really more than half of what the company is focused. 
this just this last week they won 44 Emmys, uh, what you know far exceeded the world record. And then as a product leader, you always want to have a fuzzy vision of what's next. And so the idea is maybe five or 10 years from now, the next big step function of innovation is going to be about interactive stories and games. So we're beginning to put two, 3% of our efforts to that as an experiment, just the way in 2013, we experimented with original content. But if you got kids, these are examples of interactive stories. There's Puss in Books from DreamWorks, my favorite Captain Underpants epic choice of Rama. If you're a grown up, the interactive stories that you can use today is Black Mirror Spanish Snatch. I'd love to know in the chat um, on a scale of zero to 10, those who have watched it, where 10 is great, uh, how good is Black Mirror Spanish Snatch? It's the beginning of an experiment. Some of you may have noticed the interactive version of the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt and important questions like, should she make out? or plan the wedding. As product leaders, our high level engagement metric is monthly retention. This is the, the metric that we use to define how good is our product? How good is the product quality? And for perspective, back in uh, 2002, 10% canceled every month. In 2005, 5% canceled every month. And today only 2% cancel. And that's the, 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 the highest level metric that we've all been benign, maniacally focused on as product leaders. So I wanna share with you four buckets, four high level product strategies on the left. We're maniacally focused on personalization, continue to support the original content. And we're just trying to figure out how to keep making a better watching experience. And then I've also alluded to some of these interactive storytelling. So if you take a, a simple thing like watching experience, what's the proxy metric? So the problem with, with retention is it's so hard to move and so slow to move. So our proxy for that, we, we're, we look at this every day, the percentage of members who watch at least 40 hours in a month. And we have some theories, some tactics or projects against this watching experience. If you look to the light, even better ultra high D, doing set top integrations, enabling shared viewing so you can watch uh, with your friends even if you're apart, of doing better lip sync algorithms so that Netflix can almost instantly get into 40 languages in a way that it doesn't seem unnatural. You can't tell that the person was originally filmed in French. These are some of the ideas, but really what I'm trying to share with you, we have these high level strategies on the left, we have a proxy metric that helps us understand if we're doing better or worse. And then at any moment in time, we have tactics or projects that are bringing that high level strategy to work. And then I'm sharing with you a four quarter roadmap. I continue to do these. They, there's some elements that drive me crazy about them, but I'm trying to share with you how personalization, for instance, some of the key projects and how they'll roll out over time. So for instance, this quarter, we're putting into test a mood algorithm. Hey, Patrick, what kind of mood are you in right now? Are you, are you up for a leave your brains at the door comedy or you want something cer cerebral that makes you look start? We're gonna experiment with voice recognition. It should just know by my voice that it's me and not my daughter. And, and then later uh, in the year, we'll have a movie personality quiz. Trying to understand- and Would you just test that in a single market, Gib? Would you test that in a single market or- We tend to, we tend to, to take one prototype typical market. So for instance, uh, we did a test letting customers do 25% faster or 25% slower. We actually started on mobile devices only in New Zealand. So- that's what we chose. And what we learned was that customers loved it and studios hated it. But you'll notice that we rolled it out to the rest of the world. So in that balance, it improved the watching experience. All right. So at the beginning of the year, I, I sat down with my CFO partner, marketing partner, the uh, content partner, and I said, how are we going to prioritize these three forces? Growth, engagement and monetization. And this year we just decided, you know what? It's critical that we keep growing. So we put growth first, we're measuring, we're trying to get year over year member growth of 
monetization. And we're measuring that through lifetime value of a customer. In 2005, that was about a hundred bucks. Today it's 290, we keep pushing it higher. And it makes me slightly sad to see engagement third, but when retention is at two, only 2% 2 cancel, there's not as much low hanging fruit. It doesn't mean that we won't continue to invest in that. We're just saying growth and monetization are critically more important. And so I'm illustrating for you the GEM model and how it gets all functions within a building aligned with just a basic question. How do you force rank these three things? So with that, I'll say thank you. And then I'll, I'll just be normal, Gib, again, from Bend, Oregon, happy enjoying a life of virtual talks and workshops and mountain biking and skiing. It's all good. Okay, Scott, how are things going? So, Gib, I'd love to know, you know, you've got those frameworks, the GEM framework, the DHM framework. I might forget one of the acronyms exactly, but... You know, Glee. why them over the other things that you could have chosen? Did you make them up specifically for um, Netflix's use case? Or, you know, me as a product leader, can I copy paste that and use it in, in my business and I'm going to win? Or do I need to modify it to suit my needs or pick something else? Yeah. So my super short answer is read that 13-part um, essay. Um, okay. So... I do use tools, models, and frameworks. And as, as a teacher, I try to bring them to life so that everyone can use them on their own. I have taken the ones that have been helpful to me in my job and my job working with lots of different startups, and I've killed all the sucky ones, okay? Because they sucked. So this is sort of the stuff that survived. And then Scott, different from consultants who, they also use tools, models, and frameworks, but they're not as transparent about how to use them. So my goal is that people can apply their best thinking using these tools, models, and frameworks and create a, a prototype. So here's something else that's interesting about product strategy. Um, I went to Chegg right after. I give myself two to four weeks to define the product strategy for a company. Um, do I have it right in two weeks? No, but I've created a swag, a stupid wild ass guess it's my sort of prototype of what I think is right. And it lets me test it and get feedback from everybody else who's been there for two or three years and that's smarter than me. The key thing is it's important to have a strategy um, because it helps provide a vision for the future. It, it creates hypotheses about what the most important things to focus on are. And you saw like a case of Netflix, I got it right about half the time. And that's kind of my expected outcome. And, uh, but without a strategy, I probably wouldn't have those 50% successes. And, and just to follow up, because it's yeah. relevant, there's a question around uh, from the from the, the audience around what, what's the difference in your view around product strategy versus business strategy? Are they even uh, different? Yeah. Do we yeah. care? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so everything that I've been talking about uh, is are the tools that have been helpful for me in defining a product strategy. Um, so uh, there, there may or they will likely be a broader company strategy. At Netflix, there's a content strategy, for instance, right? Or the CFO had a, a, a very specific strategy for how to raise funding. Um, so I'm very focused on the product strategy. I will tell you where there's some overlap, the Glee model, okay? But I have found that model incredibly helpful. It's, it's really important for the content team at Netflix, for instance, to know that what I would do at the beginning of this year is say, okay, what percentage of our effort are we gonna put against original content? And what percent of our effort are we gonna put against those interactive games uh, and, and stories? And this year, it'll probably be something like, we're gonna put 50% of the product team's efforts against supporting original content and three to 5% against the gleam in your eye, which is the interactive stories. So that's where it kind of munges from product into overall company strategy. No matter what, I find it incredibly helpful for every function in a company to have an aligned vision of how to prioritize growth, engagement, and monetization. When I walk into a startup just for fun, I'll ask six different people how they force rank growth, engagement, and monetization. If I get six different answers, I'm like, Houston, we have a problem. I actually don't know if that translates into 
Australia, but it means you guys are fundamentally aligned and you might be a little effed up, okay? Give, okay, can I power up. on, Scott? Gib, I've got one question if yeah. I can ask. You mentioned you got things right sort of half the time. And what kind of environment or culture that you've worked in enabled that? Because we know some companies have a very low tolerance for failure. Yeah. And for us, both Netflix and Netflix and Chegg, like what, yeah. what supported that? Yeah, so two things there. First, Michael, um, I'm always focused on three things. We're talking a lot about strategy. Um, and then I call it the consumer science, the, the experimentation. And then the third thing I focus on is culture. And I love culture because it helps people to make great decisions without even talking to each other. Um, so remember when I met Reed Hastings, the first thing he said was, we are trying to build a system of consumer science, which is we're just going to experiment to see at the end of the day what customers value and what they don't and whether we can pay for the value that they're looking for, the balancing act between delight and margin. When I first arrived at Chegg, it was a punk startup. We actually implemented the first A-B tests, like in my first month, using Optimizely. They, they didn't have their own tools. And Optimizely's tool was really quite excellent. Um, so in both companies, and I, I, I'm, I'm confident I had a hand in this, we um, encouraged risk-taking, uh, we encourage experimentation, and the most important thing is that we learn from every experiment. Uh, and, but uh, it, it's just, as a side issue, uh, I did a talk called uh, How Netflix Built a World-Class Culture, and it talks about how important setting that framework up is for a company. Okay, I'm going to do some cases. Um, by the way, Scott, how did, did people like um, the uh, Netflix's uh, banner snatch? Well, I, there was two eight out of two. ten, so okay, I'm going to take nothing. that of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, a, of a total no audience. I'm going to take that as not so much. <laughs> okay. Cool beans. Okay, case studies. We're going to do two questions uh, cases. The first thing is, I, I, I'm not going to give all the data, so you guys can ask questions. I want you to ask enough questions to form an opinion. I'm actually hoping there's going to be a little debate. Uh, and for me and everything I do, uh, like I say, good fights make good marriages. I try to to get people debating product strategy. And the first case, I asked that question. Oh, damn, Michael, I remember 75% of our audience said, yeah, of course, Netflix should launch Netflix Party. Did I get it right? You did, 75. Okay. Indeed. Yep, so let me give you some more data. So this Netflix Party, it actually exists. Um, there's a Chrome extension. You can download it. Uh, more than 10 million people have already downloaded it. I think they were forced by Netflix just recently to change their name. I don't know what their new name is, but it was a bunch of engineers at Patreon who did this. And it would you would download the Chromecast extension, and then you could watch at the same time. You could chat. You could use emojis. Way cool. Um, so this is kind of how it works. You know, you create a party, and then you let your friends know, hey, let's watch together. Sounds simple. Uh, and of course, with this, you had to install this little extension. No big deal. So every, we got three quarters of the audience saying, this is a great idea, we should do it. I just want to give you a little insight from Netflix in the area of social. So I already told you about the failed experiment. It was called Friends. Uh, and Netflix is very disciplined we call it scraping the barnacles. So we don't just let everything hang around. If, if it's not really adding, uh, in fact, it, it only got up to about three or 4% of our members were using it. We scraped the barnacle. I know Scott, you as a, a sailor understand that concept, very disciplined. And then the first platform we were on was called Xbox. Uh, Xbox, they, they thought this was the fricking best idea in the world. I said, you know what? If you get to 5% of, of your members using it, I'll, I'll be shocked. And it got to 4%, and then I convinced them to scrape that barnacle too. To my mind, if you're trying to improve retention, you want to get 10, 15, or maybe even 20% of your members engaged in something. And then uh, Netflix was expanding worldwide. It, it didn't have a ton of money in every country. So they had this tell a friend feature. So um, um, Camilla would watch Stranger Things, she'd love it. She would, could send a message within Netflix and Netflix is smart. It, 
knew she was using WhatsApp and, and Gmail, and it sent the message even though they weren't members. And they killed that as well, which is a strong signal that it didn't get used. So the key insight is your friends have sucky movie tastes and you, none of us really want everybody to know what we're watching. So this is, and it's surprising because I know most of us are using Spotify. There's a lot of very successful social features there, but it just hasn't worked for Netflix in the context of movies. So here's the thing. Netflix party, that Chrome extension grew from half a million to 5 million people using in the last year. And we know there's this thing called COVID. And, and you can stare at the Google Play Store and you'll notice there are more than 10 million downloads. So that's showing a measure for a lot of potential delight. And the engineers at Netflix are absolutely passionate about this idea. They say, we can launch it on a laptop next month. And by the end of the year, we'll be on every freaking platform. And the question I'm going to put to everybody is, will this delight in hard to copy margin enhancing ways? I gave you, Netflix has tried social like four or five times. They're always willing to try it again. Thank God they did because original content failed in 2008, wonderfully successful in 2013. But here we go. So my friend, Patrick. Will this delight in hard to copy margin enhancing ways? What, well, what's changed, I guess, potentially the execution, potentially the dynamics over the last 10 years, you developed an insight. Yep. I guess COVID's changed, technology's faster. Yep. This, this having to download a separate app feels like a massive inhibitor to engagement. And uh, Netflix could do that extremely well. They It'll could be do, magical. It. They could do it in the right? app. So the idea that you need to get two parties to download this yep. unique experience feels like a, a real inhibitor. It just quickly Googling around, it looks like Netflix party has become teleparty. So I don't know what that means. Yep. Um, it just means the lawyers from Netflix said, you cannot use Netflix in the name. <laughs> yeah, got <laughs> it. So, kill you. so my, my intuition says if it's been around that long and very few of us hear it, hear of it i'm saying don't launch i've seen spotify's kind of collaborative stuff for a while and like you i know my unit my music tastes are pretty unique even people who i think have similar tastes in music to me listen to my playlist and go hmm, weird okay and yeah. i imagine my netflix is going to be the same so I'm, I'm going with your original hypothesis okay so you're, so you're saying let's not launch it yeah. scott is this hard to copy no i mean it's i i use zoom to watch sports games with my friends it's not uh, i'm just in that sense like you can it's and that's not hard to run so i'm i don't see it as a super special feature it might be slightly i don't know it, it, it i'm thinking about the experience and retention thing but it's not going to make me if i'm thinking back to the priorities i'm not going to skip out of netflix i'm going to keep watching netflix just with zoom as well so what would how would your thinking change if i told you Amazon's movie service has this feature now. Disney Plus, their service has this. Hulu, which none of you know about, has it. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. what, what is, Michael, what does that say to you that th these other folks have, have launched it? Well, potentially is this becoming a hygiene factor, right? If, if, if there's take up and persistent take up, by the competitors of this. Yep. Um, and depending on what your numbers show you, I think the question yeah. in my mind was from a segmentation perspective and all the data that Netflix has, who is this appealing to? And is that segment on a growth trajectory? I think that's another yeah. put into. Camilla, what do you think about this idea? I think it's pretty cool. Tell me um, more. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're not an old fart 59 year old male like me. I want to hear what you think. <laughs> yeah, going. especially um, with COVID being originally from Brazil, I would love to be able to do something like this with my family. I haven't seen my family in almost two years. So cool. Yeah, it would have been great. Lily, where do you where do you fall on this one? I think there's the question you put there, margin enhancing ways and, and I think it was delight, right? Yeah. Um, and to answer that question, I don't think so, but it's, is it a feature that you just, people will expect that you have, maybe? 
the data tells that. Yeah, a bunch of issues hiding there. So um, uh, uh, I, Michael I called say, it I a, think Go ahead. Yeah. So sorry, Gibson. I was going to say this. I guess there's the opportunity of what you do with it as well. Um, is it just joining other people or can you make it more interactive? Um, you know, can you highlight if people have fantastic reactions and play them back or something like that? If you're watching a horror movie and your friends are going like this and it depends, potential, I guess there's more potential there as well. Sorry, Gib, I'll let you. I'll let you yeah, yeah, no, and I can see Angus. Angus is saying, hey, this needs to be easy. And Patrick, you got it right. Like, it sucks to have to download a Chromecast extension, right? And have two people do it. Netflix will make this magical. Um, I can see people wanting to support. By the way, uh, Lily, your point was really interesting. If Netflix is successful with interactive stories, this might be a fresh and more relevant idea when that happens. So um, here's the thing. So everybody else does this. And you know, um, Michael's point about hygiene, it, it means when we go to buy a car, of course the car has to have airbags, right? Like, and so can Netflix have a survey that doesn't service, that doesn't have this expected feature? Um, so I'm gonna tell you what happened. And by the way, I could see, Michael, we, we only changed the point of view of 10% you know, of our audience. I'm gonna tell you what Netflix did. Uh, they chose not to launch, okay? And of course they could have tested this, but they didn't even bother with that. And I just want to give you a little bit of their thinking. The first is 75% of us said, let's do this. We're freaks. I don't know if that translates. We are not normal people. Right now, we're using Zoom, using uh, Google Slides, and the Slido integration. We're just not normal people. And then to create a simple service, you have to say no a lot. Uh, if you have all these little features, it sort of adds up and it and it's it, it becomes like a Swiss Army knife. You're not sure which blade to use. And then Netflix's assessment was yet again, this would only be a two or three percenter. And Lily, to your point, the way that you get margin enhancement here, if 10 or 20 percent of the customers use this, then you have a shot at improving retention to get it from 2% down to only 1.9% 1 1 cancel every month. That's how Netflix has improved the business, sort of grinding it out with these different ideas. But Netflix, at the end of the day, chose not to do this because their job is just about making movie enjoyment made easy. When people sit down to watch a movie, sometimes they just want to freaking sit there, right? And watch a movie. They don't want to be distracted by their brother-in-law's ranting. So they chose not to do it. And I just admire the discipline. By the way, I, I reach out to my pals and guess how, what percent of customers at Hulu are using it or Disney Plus. It's a two percenter. And if they're disciplined, I'm hoping that they'll actually cut it in the future. All right, one more case for you. Here's the question. Should Netflix auto cancel inactive members? With Netflix, you sign up for a free trial, you get a first free month, you hand over your credit card. And if you don't cancel in that first month, you're, you stay with the service. But Tom Romery, he's a, the product manager for new members. He looks at the data and he notices that half a percent of members haven't used the service in the last 12 months. They probably forgot they signed up for it. And Tom's like, huh, this doesn't feel that good. And he says, you know what? We're going to send an email, uh, a notification and say, hey, would you like to cancel? You're going to make it wicked easy. And in fact, if they don't respond, and that's, he's kind of expecting that the email is going to be in the spam filter. If he doesn't hear from anyone, he's going to cancel them automatically. And the impact of this is Netflix will lose 100 million bucks in a year. This is what Tom Romery is contemplating. And I'll ask you the same question. Will this delight in hard to copy margin enhancing ways? Scott, what do you think of this idea? Oh, I, I, I actually think it will increase margin and, and an element of delight, but it's interesting because it's delight not for your 
customers potentially yeah that's where my head's going at the moment so i see uh josh Rowe out there says it's brilliant um and i see keith moore saying i'm sure people appreciate being asked if they want to cancel a service they aren't using i mean that's delight right like patrick what do you think of this as a business practice how do you feel about it i i just joked in the comments they're communists in charge of the product strategy <laughs> <laughs> But um, I, I, look, in principle, I'm totally, I'm totally aligned. Uh, you know, I think I'm, a, <laughs> I'm probably a little more conservative leaning on, on that one. Uh, yeah. I guess the question is, and you'd, and you'd have to prove to me that the delight that for someone who didn't respond and wasn't responding and wasn't noticing is there, yeah. firstly. And secondly, we'll pay back in the future because 100 million bucks is a lot of money. And so... Oh, yes. And that, that's pretty hard to defend and prove. And so you're taking a principled stance on something um, without a lot of data on the you've, got the, the, you've got the cost impact without the return impact in this decision. Yeah, yeah so um, I, the chat's flying, um, so, and I can hardly keep up with it. Uh, Sergio, just think of it as a uh, hundred million loss and high margin dollars. Peter, uh, there were a bunch of folks that uh, already answered my next question, which is, what is the hard to copy advantage Netflix would be building if they chose to do this? What is it? What is it? Well, that, that's kind of like, well, you're giving up revenue, which is hard for people. Like it's actually hard to copy for the kind of reason that Pat was just outlining. Like, yep. we, you know, the, the consumerness is like, yeah, we'd love it to be canceled. But then the, the, uh, the, the business, someone, the business leader in us is like, give up a hundred million in revenue. <laughs> yeah, Hold yeah, on yeah. a second. I need to see the ROI on that. And it's hard to put an uh, ROI on delight. Uh, like exactly Pat's point. Okay, like that's, so, that's but you've hard already, to copy. You've already said it, Scott. Margin, this is a big loser. And then yep. uh, Tamim is shouting all caps, exclamation, trust. Mm. And trust, Lily, is about what? What are you building there? What's the hard to copy Brand. advantage you're building? The brand, you're building an even stronger world-class brand. And that's the potential hard to copy advantage. Uh, Camilla, this is a high stakes or low stakes decision for you. Uh, that's a hard one. <laughs> it's a hard well, one for you? Yeah. Um, so, from a business perspective, it's yeah. really hard, like Scott said. Yeah, yeah. But and from a marketing perspective, it's really yeah. easy. Okay, yeah. good. So we know it's going to delight. We know it's going to build hard to copy advantage. And we know we're going to lose 100 million bucks. How does Netflix, Camilla, feel about losing 100 million bucks? I would say really bad. Okay. Uh, Patrick, what are the total revenues of Netflix? Oh, I couldn't tell you uh, off the top of my head. Yeah. It's going to be like, what is it, a percent, half a percent or something? Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it's 25 billion, okay? If you're doing uh, 25 billion, how do you feel about losing 100 million, Camilla? Uh, yeah, then it wouldn't matter that much to building yeah, it's actually, a really the brand, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a low stakes decision on two things. The magnitude isn't that big. I mean, it is a half of a percent. Uh, and the second is, it is totally reversible. So you could choose to do this now, but you don't have to do it forever. You know, the Amazon mm -hmm. notion, and this is a two-way door. The hardest ones are when, when, once you make it, you can never turn back and it's a huge magnitude. So the argument, this is a low stakes decision. Okay, so we'll, we'll put it to the, by the way, the, the chat was flying. Thank you everybody for participating. Um, will you auto cancel all inactive members? And by the way, Netflix, this is Tom Romery's decision right? Uh, it's not the CEO. It's not the CFO. He's the smartest person in the room when it comes to making these decisions. Okay, Michael, what do you think about the wisdom of crowds here? Well, it seems to endorse the auto cancel. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to say give as well. Um, you know, this does speak to culture. I mean, you did talk to trust, but the culture yeah. of the organization, and I think in Australia, um, some of the recent review of banks behavior, it's starting to be ingrained into boards and management just because you can, is there a healthy enough culture to ask the question, should we? Yes. And yeah. so uh, I, I think that's great that Netflix 
you know, seems to have asked both of those questions. Yeah, and Scott brought this up. He said, you know, the, the truth is, this is the kind of decision that Netflix, that's now big, <laughs> And, and has that economy of scale can afford to, to make, right? So if you're a punk startup or you're still five or 10 years in, into this journey, uh, you know, you, you're not going to think exactly the same way. So Netflix chose I to roll Gibson, this out. Can, and in fact, people, people oh, noticed sorry, it. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I think it's something that you can also test in a small market if you're, if you're really uncertain as well. Yes, I, I agree with you. But this got picked up, you know, and, and this was a very positive brand move. And by the way, uh, they, they actually chose not to test this, but you, know, you, you can't know everything through tests. I mean, what is the impact of this strong brand move? Did it in fact, you know, bring in more customers? Did those customers that they canceled feel good about the service and come back a year later when they had time to watch? You, don't, you can't know everything from testing. So here are the learnings. It's all about building that hard to copy advantage in the brand. And Tom's thinking was it was worth spending a hundred million bucks. But to his point of view, it really wasn't money that Netflix deserved anyway. And this is about the cost of ethics of doing the right thing and building a world-class brand, which, which Michael talked about with some of the banks in Australia. And at the end of the day, Tom said, this is no big deal. It's a low stakes decision. So I'm gonna bring it home for you all right now. We've been talking about strategy. Here is a, a, a woman that's working to discover this route to who knows what it is, to um, interactive games or whatever for Netflix. It's about discovering that route to continuing power in a significant market. And it's all about forming these strategies, these hypotheses through which you will delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. And these frameworks to, to Scott's question and discussion earlier, they, they help you to think through these issues and to combine the discipline with some of the chaos that you inevitably find inventing the future. And at the end of the day, they help you to communicate an inspired vision of the future, which is what I hope that I was able to do in that second chapter when I pretended I was back at Netflix. At the end of the day, this is about doing the hard, hardest thing, which is inspire great work. If you wanna build a ship, don't drum up the people to gather wood, divide the work and give orders. Teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. This is a, a juicy quote from Antoine de Saint Exupéry. I don't think I have, I, sometimes I put in a, a picture from Melbourne. So with that, I'll say thank you. These are stranger times. I recognize that. And if you know me, my consumer science is about to play out. Sometimes I feel like I'm a street performer doing my best to breathe fire. Um, and, and this is that incredibly awkward moment where I'm passing the hat, but I am not asking for money. I just would love your feedback. So uh, Camilla is dropping a link into the chat right now, but um, I also am pulling up my phone. A link magically popped up. And this is for a net promoter score survey. Zero sucks, 10 is great. You can choose any number that you like. The likelihood that you would recommend this talk to a friend or a colleague. Uh, I have like 15 different talks and this is how I learn what works and what doesn't. So, so I just thank you in advance. And by the way, I get amazing ideas because I asked two more questions. What was good about this? And what's one thing that could make it better? So some of the comments have just inspired all new talks been really great for me. Same QR code as before, um, but I put a custom page up for you at gibsonbiddle.com strategy. Or if you just go to gibsonbiddle.com, the top link on the page is waiting for you. And again, Camilla's link bombing you. Thank you, Camilla. Uh, the PDF's there, that series of medium. I won't be able to answer all the questions, but eventually I do. I, I write this uh, Ask Gib uh, newsletter on Instagram, uh, on, on uh, Substack, but uh, yes, I have one on Instagram. I'm trying to be a cool kid. It's impossible, right, Patrick? Um, do subscribe to the thing. By the way, uh, Scott, Camilla, Lily, Michael, Patrick, thanks so much for being part of it and for bearing with my funny accent. Um, with that, I'll say thank you. This was one of my guilty pleasures from, from the last year. Uh, so you've learned even more about my bizarre movie tastes. I see tons of questions. 
And now I'm going to shut up and stop sharing. And Scott, you could just tell me what to do. Yeah. So I think um, we're, we're a bit kind of close for time. Have you got time for one or two questions, Gib? Absolutely. And then what, what I might So yep. first of all, yeah, big thank you again to everyone. Um, Gib, thanks for, for joining us. Thank you for everyone in the audience for joining in. The chat's been just fantastic. All the, all the different thoughts and everything I've, I think made it like quite a fun thing to be involved in just want to say a big thank you to mike and and pat for for being um putting their hand up to to be on on the panel and join in the conversation as well i'm just gonna we've got so many questions what i do want to say is use use um the ask gib uh email if you've got questions for gib you can ping him you can ping camilla or me and we can forward them on to gib just because i know there's a whole bunch and i'm i'm gonna have to um just kind of cherry pick Two, I'm going to cherry pick two because we are a bit strapped for time. Um, so there's one here that is around the essence of AI. How much of the strategy has been experiment and then measure and evaluate? And how much has been survey slash ask the market about what to do? So I kind of take it as how much were you evolving the strategy as you went? Or did you just kind of sit there and have that two week period where you said, great, I've got it. And it just kind of magically played out. Um, love to hear your thoughts on that, Gib. Yeah, so let's let's look at through two lenses. So remember from the Glee model, what are these big step function innovations from DVD by mail to streaming to interactive to original content? You know, and Netflix is making a bet that it's going to be interactive stories and games. Um. That is vision inspired, okay? That's saying we have to keep innovating. We have to keep exploring the future. And we know that when we share this with customers early, they're, they're going to say it sucks. Everything sucks at the beginning. Um, but clearly for each of those step functions, Netflix endured. Um, so that was sort of almost Netflix led. And by the way, like I gave you one interesting one. Original content failed in 2008, but then worked in 2013, largely because Netflix had economy of scale and they also learned to invest in episodic TV series with binge watching. The harder one, and this is where I just think it's experimentation. Um, how important to a customer is social? How important to a customer is um, binge watching, okay? How important to a customer, what's the, you know, how important is price versus having tons of content? And those are all the things that we could only learn through A-B testing. And it was always trying to understand the balancing act between delight. Like we know you'd all love to have your price cut in half, but in that case, there wouldn't be enough margin to support investing in all the other stuff that you want. Um, so for all that sort of near term, you know, things two, three years out, it was all experimentation to see whether or not it delighted a customer and whether we could build the hard to copy advantage. And if it improved retention, then it would improve margin. So it was largely experimentation. Okay, thanks for that. And then just the last one here, I'm going to summarize on it. How did you define your customers? Especially because the broad reaching like, Netflix is so broad reaching, you know, using yes. segments, jobs to be done, personas, or did you yeah. just kind of go, it's got to work for everyone? Uh, I will just tell you the truth. I, I, like, I was aware of ideas like segmentation studies. I just started Netflix. I, you know, back then we had one or 2 million members and my marketing partner said, no, we're, we're just going to try to create one simple service for everyone. <laughs> And damn you, Gib, you're going to have to figure out how to personalize it so <laughs> people get the stuff that they want and need. Um, so that's how I played out in Netflix. Um, so that's super yes. interesting. No persona, yeah. no jobs to be done. Just uh, per, has yeah, to work for everyone. I mean, I, I mean, I learned all those ideas. And, you know, at the end of the day, I was maniacally focused on how do we delight customers. So that's, you know, probably a jobs to be done. And then the persona thing, the reality is I didn't find the persona stuff that ha help, helpful. Um, you know, they were sort of abstractions of customers. I was spending a ton of time all the time with real customers. 
And I didn't need to really create these abstractions or create different bucket types. Yeah, so super interesting. I, yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm not saying there's one good or bad. It just, that's what worked for me. That's your, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Gib, thanks so much for your time again. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up. Again, shoot emails through if you've still got questions. Thanks so much to the audience. And uh, stay tuned for our next kind of webinar um, coming up. So thanks so much, everyone. Speak to you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.